Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my channel. In today's video, we'll be talking about a pretty rare car. It's a 1994 Mazda 929. We'll find out more about the model, the history of it, why Mazda was developing it, and why we no longer see them on the roads. Let's go. All right, to talk about Mazda 929, we've got to go back a little bit in time. Quite a bit in time, actually. So let's go back to the 1950s. If you watch the movie Back to the Future, specifically part three, and it has absolutely nothing to do with the movie, I just want to give you an idea about the sentiment that existed in the society at the time. Doug Brown pulls apart whatever broke down in DeLorean, picks that part and says, well, no surprise, it failed, it's made in Japan. 1950s, manufacturing in Japan was, well, to say the least, not the dominant industry. And it was not, Japan was not known as the industrial giant. The war damaged the Japanese economy, and very few products were actually sold or exported abroad. 20 years later, we we'll need to look in the 70s as the time when the Japanese manufacturers started actively entering the US market and became successful because of the oil shocks of that decade. The popularity was growing so fast that in the 80s, President Reagan going on an official visit to Japan strikes a deal with the Japanese uh, prime minister at the time that Japan manufacturer, Japanese manufacturers will not export more than 1.7 million cars to the United States. So naturally, they had two options. Option number one, build locally, which a lot of manufacturers did in the 80s, 90s. That was the time when Japanese manufacturers were actively building their factories in North America. The other option is to export something that has a better margin, something that you can sell more expensively, keep more in profit. And that's where we started seeing more luxurious Japanese cars not previously sold in the export markets. One of them was a Mazda 929, which was originally based on Mazda Luce. Let's start with an interesting confusion in pronunciation and language origins of the model name. Obviously, your car may not sell very well if you name it after fish, which Luce is. And Mazda's marketing team were not all avid fishermen. The model's name should be pronounced Luce, which means light or beam of light in Italian, since this model has Italian roots. Its first generation was designed by Maestro Giorgetto Giugiaro, who worked at Bertone at the time and presented the first prototype in 1965. The first time the 929 badge showed up on a Luce was in 1973 with the second generation of the model headed to export markets. First 929s were available as station wagon sedans or coupes, but rotary-powered two-door exported Luches were known as RX4 in convention with Mazda's Wankel engine naming tradition. The new generation of Luce came with a more powerful 2-liter engine starting from 1975 and the older expert designations of 1500 and 1800, which were based on the available engines, became irrelevant. Thus, a more generic name seemed more appropriate. Here comes 1977 and outside of Japan, dealers were receiving a brand new Mazda Lucha Legato badged as 929L. This generation did not have a two-door option, but was offered with a four-door hardtop instead. A station wagon followed in 1979 and stayed in production until 1988, even after the sedan was replaced by a successor. This was the last wagon to wear 929 logo. The design of this generation, as well as many Japanese cars of that era, was heavily influenced by their American counterparts. Earlier cars featured stacked headlights, which were later updated with large single-lens headlights. The conservative chrome grille contrasted with the progressive for its time interior. The next generation of Luce was internally designated as HB. However, on the export market starting from 1982, 929 also had a coupe which was a rebadged Mazda Cosmo. It turned out to be a fairly popular car and Chinese manufacturer Haima made a licensed version of this generation of Luce from 1992 to 2002. This generation got its first fuel injection and the new turbocharged 2-liter engine rated at 122 horsepower. The main difference between the Japanese Lucha and Exporting 929 was a slightly more conservative design of the front for both coupes and sedans. The last generation of Mazda's Beam of Light was produced between 1986 and 1991. Both 929 and Lucha got the first ever Mazda V6 available in 2-liter naturally aspirated turbocharged versions and a top-of-the-line 3-liter option. The later was the only available V6 option in the North American market 
with a majority of 929s of this generation sold with this particular engine. 2.2 liter 4 cylinder was also exported to the US and Canada, but is extremely rare. One notable equipment package popular in Canada and northern states of the US was the winter package that added heated seats, a more powerful alternator, and winter tires. 929s of this generation came with both 5 speed manual and a 4 speed automatic, and the majority of the cars sold in the US were automatic. The car had a reputable speed for its time of almost 120 miles per hour and could hit 0 to 60 in 9.2 seconds with its manual transmission or in 10 seconds with an automatic. Mazda kept manufacturing Lucci even after 1991, but only for fleet sales, but also sold a license to an emerging Kia that used it as a flagship model, Potentia. Let's talk about the exterior. So when Mazda was developing this car, they were doing something not very typical for them. This is a luxury sedan and it was designed accordingly. Handling, performance, comfort, those are the three things that Mazda had in mind when they were designing this vehicle. In terms of overall styling, this is a typical 90s Japanese sedan, so nice, soft shapes, bio design, I think it's called. We naturally have sunroof, again, 90s, that was considered to be cool. It is still cool. We have the chrome details all around the window frame. Talking about the doors, we have frameless doors. I think that is pretty awesome. Two-tone color, that's what they say in official brochures. So if you look very carefully, for instance, right here, we see that the top and the bottom, they have a slightly different color. And it's not because the car was in any accident. It was naturally, that's how they came from the factory. The top is this grandpa racing cream. The bottom is a bit grayish. So again, not something unusual for the 90s. I think it has the right to be here. With Lucia's discontinuation, 929 continued in the form of Mazda Sentia that we're testing today. Starting from the 1980s, Japanese manufacturers were actively introducing new premium brands and we came to know Acura, Lexus and Infiniti as competitors to German luxury sedans. Mazda was trying not to be too far behind, introducing Yunos, Autozam and Infiniti brands domestically and where Sentia was actually sold as Infiniti MS9. But Sentia was also supposed to be a test of the long-awaited luxury brand Amari, with its second generation branded accordingly which due to the financial difficulties of Mazda and its smaller market share compared to other Japanese manufacturers was shelled before it came to fruition. You will also notice that up front the car looks relatively narrow compared to the length of it and that was done on purpose. In Japan there is a tax if your car is wider than a certain limit you gotta pay a certain fee. So when Mazda was designing it they had to make it look longer to still give the same comfort give the same luxury features and whatnot, yet keeping it within the limit without any additional fees involved. Also, styling. This is not some custom feature. 929s came with gold-plated emblems, which I think is a pretty cool feature we lost after 2000s. I mean, I see them occasionally on the cars right now, but we need to bring them back. Nothing says luxury more than a gold-plated emblem on the car. I may be a little bit joking. Also notice a chrome grill, but there were additional chrome styling package that could add chrome on the bumper right there at the bottom, as well as on the side trim. The work on the successor to a popular Lucha started in 1988. That turned out to be a more challenging task than anticipated and the project changed several lead designers. In the end, the final product turned out to be an engineering masterpiece. Just listen to this. Sentia had almost perfect weight distribution, 53 to 47, low center of gravity, multi-link suspension front and back, low weight body parts including aluminum hood. Moreover, it featured all bells and whistles Mazda offered at the time, such as cruise control, ABS, front airbags, power windows and mirrors, and even four-wheel drive and four-wheel steering on certain expert markets. Under the hood we have a 3.0-liter V6, 200 horsepowers. For the Japanese market, Sentia also had a 2.5 liter V6, 160 horsepowers, again, tailored towards minimizing the tax burden. Both engines came with a 4 speed automatic that has a sport mode, but we'll test that later in the test drive. You may notice that the engine on 929 is pushed towards the body. This was done to achieve better weight distribution, which is known as front midship layout. V6 under the hood is the evolution of the earlier six-cylinder introduced in the previous generation. 
That exact engine was featured on several Mazda models of the time, such as the minivan MPV. It had a decent fuel mileage for its time, capable of 19 miles to the gallon in the city and 24 miles to the gallon on the highway. Honestly, before we go talking about the rear of the car, I think 929 is the most elegant Mazda they ever designed. And I know that it is a very subjective opinion, let's put it this way. But I think they made this a very balanced, well-designed car. And if you look at their promos, they called it a piece of art. And I can see that it is. It is. So we have, again, gold-plated emblems. I really like the taillights, the kind of this spread 90s style taillights. But let's look back in the trunk. So the trunk we're going to open with a key, but naturally we're not, we're in a luxury car after all, right? So we're going to just click at the button on the driver's door. The trunk actually is surprisingly not very spacious and it is caused by the fact that they're trying to make it handle better. They put the gas tank right on top of the axles. Under the floor we have the section for a spare wheel and a jack but I mean here is the volume of it but as you can see it's not super impressive. One of the most advanced features of 929 was the so-called solar ventilation system. The setup here featured solar cells in the sunroof and additionally small ventilation fans located in the trunk area. The fans will cool the cabin while the car is parked in the sun during warmer months and the solar panels were also capable of charging your battery during the winter. The moment you get in the Mazda 929, you would never guess you are inside of a Mazda. Why? There is no badge on the steering wheel. And if you look around, unless you have the standard factory Mazda radio, there's no indication that it is a Mazda. Brilliant. The steering wheel, which I actually like the solution, they have darker black plastic combined with a beige. And I mean, how many times have you seen the steering wheel from like a beige or gray interior that honestly, with all the usage, it gets dirty? Well, this steering wheel obviously faded from 105,000 miles of use, but still it is, I think it's just, it's a pretty good contrast. It does work out fairly nicely. On the steering wheel, we do have control of the uh, steering system, it still works. We do have the cruise control and talking about cruise control, things become more interesting. So in order to turn it on, you need first to click on the left side of the dash. You got to click uh, this little lever up to turn it on. And then when you get to the desired speed, you click set. There, here on the left side, we also have the controls for the electric mirrors. Again, 9090s. That seems like a pretty standard feature now. 1990s. That was a cool feature. We have fog lights control. We have the on the both sides of the gauge cluster, those two plastic covers you might see, but actually this is where you have all the indicators popping up, like check engine, fasten the seat belt, ABS light, everything. The gauge cluster itself, the gauges look kind of sportish. You have this like alum aluminum trim, kind of signals that it is sportish. I love how, yeah, I don't know how, I would put it like concerto, I don't know, like very strict, classic, gauges i i like it i like i like the font really much on the right so we have tachometer speedometer indicators of the setting on your automatic gearbox you have the gas tank indicator fuel indicator engine temperature cruise everything everything you may want on the right side the first thing you notice is the clock it's obviously battery powered but still this is awesome not like, I mean, in the 90s, not in every single car had it. Then you have the, obviously the defroster, the warning lights and the climate control. And that's another cool feature of a 929. So the climate control here allows you, obviously it has an automatic setting so you can set a temperature, either in Celsius or Fahrenheit, and it will keep it in the car. It will keep this temperature in the car. They have a mode, you can select where the air is going in and out. And you probably already noticed that we have a lot, a lot of deflectors. So you have those little deflectors right here at the bottom of the dash con. I, I find it pretty cool. You have one that is really, literally pointing at the driver. You think the passenger is missing out? Here's another one for the for the passenger. And that's not it. Obviously, yeah, you have the one on, um, on, on top of the dash. 
but even more we have on all on the front doors on both front doors we have vents coming out of here that's i don't know i've never seen anything like that maybe it's because i never had the car that has a frameless frameless doors and i mean maybe i don't know you tell me tell me in the comments if i'm right or wrong but also you have deflectors here on the left um here on the door towards the bottom so it is actually very warm in the car all the time that i'm driving it so how do they get the deflectors i also like this part the beauty the genius is in the simplicity as i like to say the vents are coming here out of the dash on the left side and they go in the vents in the door simple thing but that honest is a game changer i wish they keep doing it it's so nice the material everywhere in the car it is so soft it's so comfortable i don't see many squeaks except for obviously this part and i have a suspicion so a clip is missing here so i i don't know i never looked into that but i do need to figure it out anyway talking about the driver's door we have power windows we have a chance to block them obviously on off we have the central lock notice the chrome details here as well on both driver and passenger door we also have those little pockets really nice and convenient on the driver's one we also have the regulators for opening the trunk the trunk button and the guest door button we're moving back to the center console where under the stereo we have this little compartment right here opens locks you can put the, probably a phone right here I, I did put the phone here so that's comfortable but actually it's a 2d system so if you don't like the cassette player nowadays you can easily mount a new screen and it would actually look like it was designed to be there that is pretty cool the gear lever here is very nice very pleasant to touch it's made out of leather with a scrum detail surrounding it and next thing what on earth is this right you may be wondering what is under this little cover and actually in a more luxurious version of 929 in like a more luxurious stream you have heated seats in here the question is why would you do that right why would you put a cover on top of that maybe to protect your yourself from a passenger who likes to you know turn the heat while you're not seeing it well actually the reason is way simpler than that if you click on the button right here now it doesn't slide as easily but here are cup holders come on it's a car designed for the north american market it better have cup holders so here we have the cup holders the slightly smaller one on the left slightly bigger one on the right again beautiful well-organized car moving on we don't have like a traditional glove compartment right here on the passenger side is where you stood but we do have one here in the armrest it's not very deep but at the same point of time has everything that we need including the manual the registration and whatnot finishing up with the front seat seats are actually fairly comfortable again for the 90s they were probably very even luxurious leather where it survived is very nice and pleasant to touch I don't know now i will give it like a c plus in terms of the grade for quality of the seats seats for the comfort i find it weird actually the size of the headrests i don't know they kind of look small for, even for the 90s like in the 80s i could see that early 90s uh, they kind of were getting bigger but i don't know maybe it's just me being picky but let's go in the back the central console with the armrests and cup holders was a brand new feature for 1994 even the so-called base model was fully equipped for the 90s, but there were also two main option packages available. The first, known as the leather package, which is installed on our car, featured the leather interior with power seats in the front and the armrest with a compartment in the back seat. A more luxurious premium package added wooden trim to the interior's plastic, powerful CD stereo with 12 speakers and a CD changer in the trunk, tinted windows and a keyless remote security system. Without the package, 929 still came with an alarm system, which was activated by locking and unlocking the car with the key. On the back here, there's a plenty of space for, I would say, three adults fairly comfortably. The carpet uh, in 929 is very soft. I wouldn't say it's a bit lower, but it's very close. Back seat, very comfortable. In terms of the headspace, so I am 6'2", and I'm trying to sit as close to the back as possible and because it has a bit of the angled roof kind of reminding you a little bit of a hard top it's um a little bit tight but not like critically you can always slide a bit down and the seat is like fully pushed back in here and it's still fairly comfortable in here so leather the back seat here looks like no one has ever been sitting on it i know it's a cliche to say that but it really looks like it if we open the 
armrest. And this is honestly, you could see it being an executive car uh, to an extent. The armrest also comes with a glove compartment, as you can see. I don't know, you can put probably a couple of books or maybe of water, I don't know, something in here. Yeah, that, that is a neat feature. Both seats, the uh, passenger and drivers, they have like a small pocket and actually it's a fairly rigid pocket. So you can indeed carry the documents in here. And I don't know, have a business meeting behind us on the shelf. There are two speakers and they work perfectly fine. At the time they were of a decent quality. The shelf itself, unfortunately is somewhat loud when especially gets cold it shrinks a little bit and it's it rattles but i think it's just the time taken it's still not don't think it's necessarily was a thing when the car was brand new we have ashtrays because in the 90s people still smoked quite a bit and they're easily removable you can uh, toss them out the plastic again everything is of a very high quality and you would not expect it from a mazda which we still to me at least it is associated as to be a car, like a sportish car, at least the image that they have there right now is this one. There are a lot of small features here, for example, an additional air vent under the steering wheel, smaller sun visor on top of the rear view mirror, and the handbrake here is located by the pedals, similar to American cars. But now it's time for a test drive. So the first thing in terms of handling, this car actually handles pretty well compared to, for instance, American cars of that era, similar sized cars, and has one major advantage over some of the Japanese salon sedans of that era, and that is rear wheel drive. More importantly, this car was meant to be driven, not to be sitting in the back, no matter how great the couch there is. Everything is pointed towards the driver, the dash, the gauges, everything within the reach of an arm. Once again, it does handle really well, very sharp. There is still a bit of a body roll in there, but I guess there has to be a little bit of a compromise between handling and comfort, especially we talk about 1990s. In terms of noise, we are going about 40 miles per hour right now, and it is quite comfortable. I wouldn't call it luxurious level of comfortable, like in BMWs or Mercedes of that era, still it is comfortable to talk to uh, the passengers if we had any in the car. Primary source of noise is honestly, I can hear the road, so it could be the tires that are in this car, they're not the greatest. It could be simply there is not enough soundproofing material put on the wheel arches. The engine itself is not very loud, neither is the exhaust, though it is an aftermarket exhaust. In the meantime, we are entering the highway so we'll try to get it to about 70 miles per hour and we'll see how we feel in this car in that speed so the faster we're going the louder it gets which is something yeah we have, may have anticipated and honestly at about 70 miles per hour i gotta raise my voice in order to communicate with you which i don't know if this is I'll be honest with you, I didn't drive that many Japanese cars from the 90s, but it kind of sounds still a bit loud. The sport setting on the gearbox here just allows us to rev the engine at the high RPMs, and yeah, it does give you a bit of a better dynamic when you're driving in a seat and you want to be a little bit more aggressive. Yet, the handling, even though it is sharper compared to its American counterparts of the, of the time, still doesn't give you the same performance you would get from a smaller Miata, still far from a luxurious sedan of that era. In 1991 and 92, Mazda sold over 43,000 929s worldwide, but by 1994, the number did not even reach 10,000. At that time, larger premium Japanese sedans were replaced by the luxury bandit compatriots, even Toyota removed its Cresita from the North American market. Why we don't see 929s on today's roads? Why the model ceased its existence in the export market essentially after late like 95, 96. The second generation Sentia was still sold in the export market, specifically in Australia. And from what I understood, it was so expensive that it could cost as much as a Mercedes E-Class, yet being still a Mazda. So no surprises that uh, buyers were not willing to pay as much for a Mazda. Again, nothing wrong with the car, but 
it's all about price quality ratio. 929 ended up being the last attempt to build a luxury sedan with a rear wheel drive. The successor Mazda Millennia was already a front wheel drive, even though it still had a dust of luxury and was very comfortable. Not a great car overall. It was still far from that experiment, this radical diversion from everything Mazda made in this class of the vehicles. There are very few of them left on the roads. Unfortunately, cash for clunkers did a big thing for it. In the second, of course, it's rust. This vehicle in particular had rear wheel wells already fixed at one point by the previous owner. And from what I understood reading the reviews on various sites, Edmunds, Cars.com, that was a great car for a lot of people. Oftentimes the first vehicle or the first family car in a way, but a lot of them died or fell apart essentially, rusted through. So that's the story. Let me know what you think about the car. Let me know what you think about the video and comment, subscribe, like. We need support on this channel. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day and see you in the next videos.